All right. How many of you love Christmas time? Yeah, does it just make you feel good? Everybody's just so happy during Christmas, it seems like. And um, for me, you know, one of the favorite carols that I have as we wrap up this series, Christmas Carols, for those of you who haven't been with us, each week of December, we've been highlighting a different Christmas carol and uh, going through the theme of that carol. And this morning, we're going to highlight actually one of my favorites, Away in a Manger. How many of you, if you raise your hand, know Away in a Manger, that song, yeah? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to just take a minute, and you can read along with me on the screen. I want to read the lyrics, so just so we can understand what is being talked about here in Away in a Manger. It says, Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky, they looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep in the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love thee, Lord Jesus. Look down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care and take us to heaven to live with thee there. Now, this carol was actually published in the mid-1880s. But the author is actually still unknown. There's great debate around who actually wrote this carol that most of us have come to know and love. But what's important really is the lyrics of the song have touched so many people's lives that it doesn't really matter who the author really is. I think one of the things that most of us love about this carol actually is this sense of this sweet, innocent little baby Jesus, this cute little newborn baby. And he's humbly around all the little animals, right? And we picture the little kids' nativity scenes, and it's such a cute little picture. And what amazes me is I have for so long missed out on what I believe is actually the main thing we should highlight here in this Christmas carol. And the focus, I think, should really be, this morning we're going to highlight the little Lord Jesus. That Jesus is Lord. It's said almost in every line of this Christmas carol. And so I want to highlight this morning that Jesus is Lord. Let's pray. Father, I pray, God, that you would be praised. You would be honored, Lord, by this word this morning, oh God. I pray that you would speak into our hearts and our ears, God. We're ready to hear from you, Lord. So, Father, I ask by your Holy Spirit, oh God, guide and direct the word this morning. Help touch our hearts with it, that we would leave transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when we talk about Jesus as Lord, I want to highlight what does the word Lord mean? What does that word Lord mean? Well, in the Greek, which was the original language of the New Testament, the word for Lord was kurios. Now, kurios, as you'll see on the screen, means supreme, means authority, means master, means controller. Kurios means Lord. So when we say that Jesus is Lord, we're saying that Jesus is supreme. Jesus is the authority. He's the master, the controller. Now, the idea of supreme authority, master, controller of our lives, it sounds like something we all want, right? For ourselves. Don't you want to be like how I feel when I, I say, yeah, I love to decide what I want to eat. I love, now that I'm an adult, I get to pick what I want to eat for a meal. I don't have to eat what my parents tell me to eat anymore. I get to decide everything. That's the beauty of it, right? How many of you are like me that you like to be in control when there's a car being transported from one place to another? I mean, you want to be the driver. Let me see the drivers out there. Raise your hands. Let's see. There better be half the people in the room. Otherwise, I don't know how you got here, okay? Let me see. Okay, I love to drive. If you ask my wife, she always is like, hey, do you want me to drive, honey? And I have to step very carefully, and I'm like, yeah, I think I'd rather just drive. Today's our day off. I'm just trying to relax, okay? Can I just drive, please? I love to be in control. This is what we're getting at. I think many of us would say it's hard to give up control in our lives. 
You know, we see this with our jobs. I want to decide what job I work, what's best for me in life. I want to decide how I raise my kids. Don't tell me how to raise my kids. I'm going to raise them the way I want to raise them. How about for some of you who are still single? I want to decide or control who I date. Amen? Come on. I don't want somebody to tell me who I should date or, oh, this person's got a great personality. No, no, no. I want to choose the best person for me. I want to be in control. How about your future? How many of you already have some plans for your future this morning? You've already got decided what you want to do, what you want to become in life. Everything in our lives, the more we unpack it, is we love to be in control. We love to be the authority of our own lives. If I want something, I get it. No one's going to tell me I can't have it. And that what's going on is in society is society is becoming more independent, more free thinking about what I can do in my own life. And I'm breaking away from cultural norms of following authorities. You know, one of the things I love about Indonesia, when I came here, I realized very deeply entrenched in the culture is respect for authorities. Okay, I'm talking about within your families, whether it's an older brother or sister, whether it's your mother or father, whether it's grandparents, whether it's teachers, whether it's officials, whether it's a pastor. There's this respect level that you all have in a culture, and it's really cool to see. And I saw this when I grew up as well in the U.S., that I learned that there's certain people based on their position that you just respect. You just honor them because it's their position. But now what I see happening all around the world, and maybe this is also changing here in Indonesia, is there's this turning away from it and this more of an idea of saying, you can't tell me what to do. Why are you the person to judge me on the way that I act or the things that I do? And this is what's going on, I believe, all around the world. There's a lack of sense of authority figures in people's lives, and we're becoming more our own authorities, our own masters, our own controllers, that we get to decide what we want to do. And most of us, we have a problem with not being the Lord of our own lives. It goes the best when I get to just make every decision because it's exactly what I want, when I want it, and how I want it. So here's the question for us this morning, church. How do we change that mentality? How does our heart change from the idea of having all the control, from being the main authority in our lives, from being, I don't know if you heard this saying, the captain of our own ship, that I get to go where I want to go. I get to stop when I want to stop. How do we give all that up and accept Jesus as Lord? How do we give it all up and accept Jesus as Lord? Well, point number one this morning, if Jesus is Lord, we have to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. We just sang in this song, we recognize that Jesus is Lord. We sang about his lordship. Luke himself wrote in Luke chapter 2 verse 10, also about Jesus' lordship at birth. Thousands of years before this song was ever written, the Bible spoke of it. Luke chapter 2, verse 10 says this, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is, everyone say together, Christ the Lord. Amen? The angel is telling the shepherds, There's good news coming. It's going to cause great joy for everyone. This little baby Christ, the Lord, is come upon this earth. Now, in our society today, this might sound like bad news. Wait, what do you mean? This this isn't good news. Why do I want somebody to be Lord over me? I don't want somebody to control me, to be somebody I always have to listen to. And he's saying, no, no, no. The angel says, no, this is good news for you. It's going to cause great joy for everyone. Why? Because he's come to save us. He's come to make a way for sinners, all of us, to be clean, to live holy lives, 
to be in relationship with God again. See, most people don't know that they're missing something in their lives. And this is the good news that we have the opportunity to share with them. It's going to be great joy for them when they finally understand that Jesus came to save them and he came to bring them back into relationship with God. Amen. This is the best news ever. It's not bad news that someone else is in control. It's great news because we're finally saved. So we see that Jesus was Lord at birth. Jesus then was Lord at death. Jesus was and always has been the Lord. And Jesus, church, is Lord today. That's the good news. He always has been the Lord. He always is the Lord. He always will be the Lord of your life. He always is. He's Lord over everything. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1. He says this about Jesus. For in him, in Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. So here's the question. If he created all things, then what? What does this mean for us? Then it means that he's the master of all things. That means he's in control of all things. So what this really means is that Jesus is Lord over everything. He's Lord over the storms in the water. You know the story where the disciples, the fishermen, they're freaking out. They're, they're scared. They're going to die in the boat. The sea is coming over and splashing. They're going to drown. And Jesus was what? Sleeping in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. And they're crying out, Jesus, save us. Don't you care? We're going to die. And what happened? Jesus woke up and he said, peace, be still. And the water was calm. The wind stopped. He's Lord over the waters and the wind. He's Lord over the sick. We've seen him time and time again. He's healed many people. He healed the blind who have been blind their whole lives. And when they encounter the Lord Jesus, instantly they're healed. He healed those who were deaf, could not hear. He opened their ears. He touched the tongues that were tied that could not speak, and they began to speak when they encountered the Lord Jesus. He's Lord over the lepers, the people that cast other people away from them because they can't even be near them because of the disease they have. And what does Jesus do when he encounters the ten lepers? He tells them to go to the temple, and as they're walking away, they're healed. He's Lord over sickness, church. He's Lord over the demons. The demons run and flee at his name. He is the Lord of all things. He's Lord over financial situations. How many of you sometimes worry about finances? I know I do sometimes. But can I encourage you this morning, church, that he's Lord over them. In fact, remember the story with Peter. He told him to go cast his line out into the water and catch a fish to pay the temple tax. In that fish, there was a gold coin. Come on, if you can believe that Jesus provided a coin from a fish that was caught on Peter's hook, don't you think he can take care of your finances? Jesus is Lord over all the earth. He created it. Jesus is Lord over the heavens, the sky, all the stars, the galaxy, because what? He spoke them into existence, for in him All things were created. He's Lord over everything. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the undefeated one, the conquering king who's defeated sin and death, and he's Lord over all. So here's the thing. If Jesus is Lord, if he is Lord, then it's not a matter if we say he's Lord but it's about whether we live like he's the Lord of our lives. It's not about if we say he's Lord, because we already know he is. But if we say he's Lord, are we living like he's the Lord of our lives? And here's the problem. I think most Christians call him Lord, but most don't live like he's Lord. Most will call him Lord, but they won't live like he's Lord. 
And so the challenge for us this morning for point number two is that we have to submit to Jesus as Lord. If he's Lord over all, we first must acknowledge him. But secondly, just acknowledging him isn't what is the main thing. We have to acknowledge him first, but we have to submit to him. And the deception is, is that many people today will say he's Lord and they don't live like him. You know, I'll trust him in so many areas of my life, but not with the big decisions. Not with the, the, the new car that I need to buy or where I'm going to live next. No, I need to decide that because I know what I like, Jesus. I know what I want. Don't tell me to get this other one. I give him everything but my bank account. I follow Jesus and I'll go and do whatever he wants, but I'm not going to give up my career. No, that's mine. I work too hard for it. This is exactly what I've always wanted. He's Lord of my life, but not when sports are on. Come on, is anybody getting convicted yet? I know I am convicted as I say these words. He's Lord on Sunday, but not Friday and Saturday night. He's Lord when I need him, but not all the time in my life. So is he the Lord of your life? Is he the authority, the master, the controller of your life? Is he the Lord over your thoughts? Is he the Lord over your actions? Is he the Lord over your words that you speak? Because he is Lord all the time. So we have to submit to him. This is the challenge. We have to come under his authority. That's what submission means is if Jesus is Lord, we have to come underneath his authority and follow him to accept his ways and be obedient to him. We have to come to this point of surrender, church, that my ways are now given over and that I'm going to follow his way. Jesus, he warns about this challenge, right? He warns about calling him Lord, but not actually submitting to him as Lord. He talks about this to his followers in Matthew chapter 7. He says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. See, on that day, one day we're all going to stand before the Lord. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, you might be saying, even as I read this, you're probably like, why is this a Christmas message? This is pretty harsh. But you know what? I think this is so critical, church, that, that, that we understand who Jesus really is. And this is what it's all about, is we recognize him as Lord and we have to submit to his lordship and follow him. He's saying that so many people say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things for you? But really what matters is those who do the will of God. Those who will come under his authority and do what he asks them to do. We have to come to that point in our life where we submit to him and say, it's not about me anymore. It's not about my will, my plans, my dreams, my goals in life, but it's about thy will. What's your plan? What's your purpose, God? Because you created me. You created each of us for a special purpose. What is that? You know, for my wife and I, Many of you know we're missionaries here in Indonesia. I wasn't born here, as you can tell. I uh, grew up in the U.S. And um, for me, my whole life, I always had a plan of being in business of some sort. I love the idea of owning my own business, okay? That entrepreneurial kind of style of thought, okay? And I never really knew what it was going to look like, but that was always kind of my plan. And for me, most of my life, I was just kind of slowly working towards that. And it was about five years ago in my life when we had one child. My wife and I were growing in the Lord. We were more involved in our local church. We were leading some ministries. And I was reading my Bible more. I really started to, I feel like, get it. 
okay? And it came to this point about five years ago that my wife and I decided we truly want to know what is God's will for our lives. Like I felt from reading this specific verse, it challenged me to say, God, I don't want to be someone that calls you Lord, but I'm just doing my own thing. I don't want to just do what I want to do in life and still call you Lord. This verse convicted me and it shook me down to the core of everything I was thinking about. And we began to pray a very serious prayer. Our prayer was this, Lord, we know that you are the one true God and we love you more than anything. And God, we know that you're more real than anything. We want to know what your will is for our lives. And whatever that will is, we want to do it. Because I don't want to go through this life and think I'm doing what you want me to do, but really it's just what I want to do. And the Lord began to speak to us as we prayed this prayer. He began to put on our hearts international missions work. And then he began to slowly show us coming to Indonesia. And we're here today. Now, what's amazing to me as I think about this is I never in my life would have thought about being a missionary. Never. It didn't even cross my mind. And coming to Indonesia, I never had a place. I never been out of the U.S. before coming here. Okay? So when I look at this, if I hadn't submitted to the Lord and asked God, what do you really want me to do in life? Why did you create me? What's your plan for me? I never, out of a million guesses, would have guessed to come here and be a missionary. And I believe that the Lord is challenging all of us today is saying, God, what's your will for my life? I want to know what your will is and I'm ready to do it. I believe this verse really strikes to the core of our lives and says, what's God's will for me? So will we submit to him? I put, uh, if you put on the screen here, our submission test. This was just a test that I thought as we can kind of reflect on, this isn't a Uh, you know, a professional uh, test or anything that, you know, is online. This is just something I felt was a good barometer, something, a good scale for all of us to reflect on as we look at our own lives. And are we really submitting to the Lord? Number one is this, is, is he the person you talk to before you say something? Or do you just say what feels right in the moment? Is he the person you go to before you make a decision? Or do you just go with what your gut is telling you and what you really want to happen? Is he the person who has the greatest influence on you? How many of you know this world right now, it's all about influence. There's millions of influencers, and the whole goal of this life is to get more people to follow you. But is Jesus your greatest influence? And lastly, is he the person you spend time with because you love him more than anyone? I think the person we spend time with the most reveals truly who we love the most. Is he the person you spend the most time with? See, when we submit to God, our life is no longer ours. This is the scary part. You know, it's kind of like, how many of you have sold a car or a motorbike before? Raise your hand. Let me see. How many of you have sold a bigger vehicle like that? Now, when you sell a vehicle, what do you have to do? You have to get all the documents, the papers ready. And when the person gives you the money that you're asking for, for that vehicle, you give them the documents, the title, the paperwork. It shows that they now own that vehicle. You don't get to just take that car back the next day because you said, ah, I made a bad decision. No, that car or that motorbike is theirs now. They paid for it. There's a transferring of ownership And the same thing happens with us as we accept Jesus into our lives. We accept him as Lord of our lives. We've given over our lives for him to own. We come under his authority. See, our lives are no longer ours to do what we want with it. It's Christ. We owe it to him. He's the one who paid for it. He paid for it on the cross with his blood. If someone pays for something, they own it. And so when we repent of our sins and we accept Christ into our lives, we're accepting his lordship. We're accepting his authority, his control. We're calling him master. Yes, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. 
Paul writes about this very thing in Galatians chapter 2. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I've died to myself. It's now Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who gave himself, who loved me and gave himself for me. So this transferring of ownership takes place as we give our lives to Christ and we accept salvation to cover over our sins. All of us would say, yeah, I accept that. I want that. But how do we continue to leave the ownership in his hands? How many of you struggle like me that every day I want to take it back? God, you can have this area of my life, but this time I want it. I'm choosing what I'm doing in this season. I'm choosing the next job. I'm choosing the next place to live. I'm choosing the next food I'm going to eat. Whatever it is, we always go back to ourselves, and this is the struggle. So the last point is if Jesus is Lord, and we acknowledge him as Lord, and we submit to him as Lord, then what do we have to do? We have to keep him as Lord. You know, when we talk about the word Lord and the idea of authority and respecting authority, I think there's two ways or reasons why you respect someone. Number one, I think you respect someone because you're told you're supposed to, right? When I was a young kid, I was told these are the people and positions you respect because of their titles. Maybe some of you, especially younger people, but maybe some of you, you might be in church this morning just because someone said you had to be here. Like it wasn't even your choice. It was just you're supposed to be in church, so you come, right? It's that same mentality. You respect an officer of the law because someone told you. You respect a teacher because someone told you. But I think there's a second and a more deeper level of respect that can take place, and it's when you get to know someone. When you have time to learn about someone and you see their values and their character and through that you begin to respect them and when you respect them in this way, it's a lot easier to come under their authority. We're so much easier for us to submit to what they're asking us to do because we actually really care about that person. We see their true colors. It's easy for us to listen to them. It's easier for us to follow them, to be obedient to them. And so for us as Christians, we have to continue to seek Jesus. We have to continue to seek knowing him. We have to continue to build our relationship with God. So what can we do practically? What does this look like for us in our own lives? How do we continue to know him and grow in our relationship with him? Well, number one is we have to spend time with him. The more time you spend with him, the more you get to know him, see who he is. If you don't, how can you expect to know him? How can you expect to really know who God is if we don't spend time with him? I have with me here my phone, and on your phones, you can go on your app store or play store, and you can download. There's a Bible app. I know many of you have it. But it's so convenient and easy to have the Bible readily available to you. They have reading plans for every single topic. They have reading plans that will bring you through the entire Bible. I challenge you today, if you're not reading the Bible, open up a devotional reading plan. Download the app. Please get to know who Jesus is. Secondly, is you can pray when you wake up. Simply, when you wake up, say, thank you, Lord, for a new day. God, please help me today. Whatever comes before me, give me the strength. Help me to have joy. God, I'm anxious or worried about this. I give it over to you. Please let your peace rest on me. When you go to bed at night, thank him for getting you through the day. Cast your cares on him. He wants to hear from you. And you know what? The beauty is you get to hear from him. But what it's going to require for many of us is to sacrifice. How many of you feel like sometimes you're just so busy and there's so many things going on in life and you have so many responsibilities that it's hard to find time to be with God? Well, can I tell you, maybe we just need a little bit less media in our lives. I know for myself that if I just 
take a day and don't go on any media. I've got plenty of time to spend with God. But what I've realized is I've began to fill myself up with things all throughout my day that I leave no room for spending time with the Lord, that everything's got my attention and everything is instant entertainment. We have to sacrifice some time to be with him. Number three that you can do is come to church. Amen? Come to church. Join a life group. We're going we're gonna to have life groups starting up in a few more weeks. Get plugged in. Build up fellowship and friendship with the body of believers. Grow in the Lord practically. You get to be with him and you get to learn more about him and it's easier to come under his authority. The last thing you can do is, which I think is so important as a parent, is show your kids what it's like to serve him. You know, it's amazing to me how often we can tell our kids the right things to do. We can tell our kids what they should know about God and what they should believe. But how many of you know that we got to set the example first? We got to show them what it's like to serve God with joy, to make church a priority, that coming on a Sunday morning is not optional. Like everything else should come below that. Like Sundays at 10 a.m., I know where I'm going to be at because being in the house of the Lord with his believers, praising the almighty God, the king of kings, is the most important thing for me to do on a Sunday morning. This is so critical, church, and it starts with us. We don't want to fall into the trap of calling him Lord but not listen to him. I say these things, and you may say, Pastor Jordan, why, like, why are you preaching such a heavy word this morning? But I think this is the most critical thing for all of us to understand. Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? What's the point? What's the point if we call him Lord, Lord, and we don't do what he asks us to do? I think so many of us can find ourselves doing this. So many people all around the world that believe that they're following Christ and calling him Lord aren't really following him and doing his will. We need to do as he asks. What is he asking of us this morning? Well, number one is, if Jesus is Lord, that we need to acknowledge him. We need to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Secondly, we need to submit to him as Lord of our lives. And lastly, we need to keep him as the Lord of our lives. He's asking us to do these things. I plead with you, don't just acknowledge him. But would you submit to him and don't just submit to him one time, but to continue to keep submitting to his lordship of your life, that it would go well with you. In closing this morning, church, I just want to take a few minutes. I want all of us to bow our heads and to close our eyes. No one's looking around. I believe that this word was perfectly timed as we talk about the little Lord Jesus. That he's not just this little baby that came to earth and we love to think about how cute that scene, that picture is. But he came as the Lord. He's always been the Lord. And I want to ask you a few questions with every head bowed and eye closed. Maybe number one is maybe you're somebody this morning that this is the first time that you're hearing Jesus is Lord. I want to invite you to make a personal decision this morning. It's a decision that all of us have free will to make. But if you're somebody hearing this maybe for the very first time this morning, would you raise your hand and say, maybe this is the day that I've decided to make him the Lord of my life. Just raise your hand. I want to be able to pray over you. Raise your hand. If this is maybe the first time that you've heard Jesus as Lord and you want to make him the Lord of your life this day, raise your hand. I want to pray over you. Secondly, maybe you never really knew what the word Lord meant, what that title meant. 
and from this word this morning, you've started to question things and you're wondering, how does my life change because of that? Maybe you're someone who's struggling and you're wanting to take back the ownership and you're having a hard time freely giving it over to the Lord. Would you just raise your hand this morning? I want to pray over you. I struggle with this at times in my life. I really do. There's times that I want to take back my life and do what I want with it. If you're here this morning and you say, Lord, I've been struggling in this area of my life. I've been struggling letting your will be done. Raise your hand this morning. I want to pray over you. I want to pray over you this morning. I see your hands. I see your hands all around over here. Yes, I see your hands. I want to pray a special prayer over you, Father. God, I come before you, Lord. I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for your lordship. God, that you are the Lord over all things and that you bring us great comfort. Lord, that this life is not just for us to figure out on our own, but God, you have a special plan for each of us. I want to pray for the hands that are raised, Lord Jesus. Lord, those who are saying, God, I have a hard time submitting all my ways to you. And in fact, Lord, most of the time, I actually want to do my own thing. But Lord, today you see their their obedience. You see their submissiveness, oh God, to come under your authority. And I pray, Father God, that you would anoint them, Holy Spirit. Lord, that they can come underneath your authority, Lord, calling you master. God, we submit to you. God, I pray that you would bring in seasons of refreshing in their lives. Lord, that they would walk out today, Lord, feeling your peace and your freedom, knowing that they walk in right standing with the almighty God. I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, for challenging us this morning. I thank you, God, that you go before us and you have a special plan for all of us. We love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your holy name we pray. Amen, amen. Let's worship together, church. Oh, God.